What's up, folks? My name is Justin Kana. I am a YouTuber based out of Seattle who is also a professional chef in Michelin kitchens for almost 10 years. I just finished watching The Bear last night on Hulu, and I gotta be honest, I, I, I cried at the end of the show, and it was a ride of an experience, and so I wanted to take some time to, you know, tell you that I've seen the whole entire thing, but more importantly, not do like a reacts to, but almost like a factor cap or a did you know that kind of, uh, you know, a little bit of an expansion on the masterpiece, in my opinion, that is this show. Because when, you know, you might have been a chef or you might have been in hospitality or in the industry for a while and you've heard of shows like Burnt, the various uh, famous chef show with Jon Favreau. There are a ton of on-screen depictions of professional kitchen life. And I think what The Bear does so well is combining the reality of the industry, the fact that it's not trying to glamorize it in a way that makes it seem like the chef is almost a caricature of themselves, but almost at the same time not making Make it out to be something that like, oh, well, anybody can do it. It's so easy. If you love to cook, you should just open a restaurant. What I also think is so fascinating about the show is all of the different archetypes of people that I've worked with that you've probably worked with in your career that are woven into this storyline. All of the different characters have distinct characteristics, for lack of a better term, that make them unique and actually have problems and story arcs that they're dealing with as this show progresses. So without further ado, this is a series. This is probably going to be episode one and we'll just kind of see where it goes from here but i'm really excited to dig into it let's watch the bear yo yo 25 pounds 25 no no no. i ordered 200 pay for 25 take it up a loop okay so that's super common you'll get something dropped off by a purveyor and the delivery driver can just not be bothered to give you specifics or talk about numbers or anything they have one job and they have a next stop after you and so getting that is part of it also, I don't, I, I, you know, maybe this is a unique to their that purveyor and they swap that cooler out and pick it up every single time. But if it's such a small order, I find it hard to believe that they would give him that much. It's also uh, almost three pounds short <laughs> at 22 pounds. So again, like my chef brain kicks in and I'm like, that's not 25 pounds, right? <laughs> I always look at the cookbooks here. So we got Zuni Cafe. That's a legit one. Barefoot Contests at Home. And a Julia Child. No, 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 Luin, that's 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 really nice of you. Uh okay, so knife clad Japanese doesn't really go further into that. I think that the main thing that they were trying to show here is that this is not just like some wust off you know, classic German knife or, you know, there, there's clearly for the, for 99% of people, they've never seen a knife like this. And so that is immediately just kind of like a, whoa. Fire. Also looked like there was a diamond steel in there. Plus 1955 blanket line type three. Pleated? Pleated. Boom. A lot of chefs have other weird things that they collect, right? So you have knives, people have, you know, this guy has denim apparently. So the process there was sear the beef, take the beef out, roast your mirepoix, and it was, you know, whether, whether you get color on it or not, add tomatoes, and then you take that, add some stock if you want, and then add all of that to a hotel pan, cover it, and then braise it. And we can see we're at, so all of that. So getting the social media post out, uh, searing the beef, chopping the vegetables, getting more beef, going back home to get the stuff, was the first four hours of his his day basically four and a half hey, hours? Sugar. I called about the soup position. I'm massaging today. Right. You said Shit. I Sorry. Today. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Carmi. Um. Hey. Here, you give me your. Uh, um, yes. Thank you. Uh, linear. All right. Let's 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 rate this. Uh, re let's rate this resume. So, chef, foodie, a curious mind. Starts with a professional profile at the top. This will often be called the objective to obtain a chef's position with the possibility of creative freedom and the opportunity for management to respect the wisdom of traditional cuisine through a modern that's lens. It. And then, you know, just great stuff from like Alinea to Avec, which is another uh, place in, in the West Loop of Chicago. Barbecue place. Let's see. Uh, I'm serious. Heat. What's a... Uh... What's UPS? That's in Chicago or? Uh, United Parcel Service. Shit. The one. That's the, the UPS. Mail. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of chefs have backgrounds um, that are you, not in kitchens. Drove. Paid my way through culinary school. So. CIA? Uh, CIA, yeah. Culinary Institute of America. Okay, so what are you doing here? But I will get you a new mixer, okay? I promise you. Carmen! Yeah. Buzzer! Alright, that's the beef. Come on, give me a hand. 
All right, so three accurate points here. So the first one is Tina's just, you know, like stubbornness on I have my pot, I have my way, I've been doing it for years, classic, right? The other one is the, like, no English, and I think part of that is, like, unshouldering responsibility. Well, don't ask me about it because I don't speak English, and that's just a theme that comes up consistently throughout the show is that, like, she clearly does speak English. And then the last piece on, like, equipment being broken, I have a whole podcast episode with a guy named Tim Musig where we talk about gear being broken and why it sucks. He owns a place called JB Prince in New York where they just they they outfit all the the great restaurants uh, with new equipment. And and it's true. Like a lot of times equipment's broken and the technician can't come or to to Carmen's point like the, the, there's just no budget in order to be able to fix the equipment. Oh, no. it sucks. Smaller fry scoops today, chef. In that ship captain? Your mom teaches me doing sex. Oh, that's not cool. <laughs> that's how you do it. Hey, Shit yo, talking Gary, on point. Compost for me today, chef. I have to... Bottom right side of walking. Thanks, chef. That line about family meal is important, and I want to touch on it for a second because oftentimes having a place for family meal stuff to go can be really helpful because if you have extra trim or you, you had to use the inside parts of the cabbage and you have the outer leaves and you don't want to throw it away because it's still edible, the person who's in charge of family meal appreciates having at least something to pull from. So if you can go in the walk-in and you can build 40% of a staff meal or see that there's so much of it that's going to be you know able to be used, that not only helps with your food cost, but then that also helps just the creative slump of having to plan for staff meal day after day after day. Yo. This is Sydney. I'm staging today. You're what today? Staging. I, I think most of you folks know, but I think it's great that they just kind of like include it as a thing that Carmen would know and Sydney would know, but Richard would not She's know. She's helping us out today. Cousin, you ordering different mayonnaise, bro? That's That's beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, th I mean, this is interesting. So Tina says, I'm waiting for my fennel, but she's got fennel in that container there. So that's, again, that's my like sous chef brain kicking in like, hey, heard someone say that they needed fennel, but I'm seeing fennel right there. What's going on? Thank you. Low on olive oil, Carmi. Heard. Okay, that's a really shitty way to manage ordering where you're just constantly getting bombarded. The thing that helped me a lot was I put a whiteboard up on the wall and it just said the word order list and then an underline and then if you had anything that you needed ordered you put it on the whiteboard because that con that doesn't seem like a lot someone uh but think about it that guy had to wait he had to he had to think oh i need to tell carmen about olive oil then he needed to go to where carmen normally is in the kitchen see that carmen's not normally there maybe he went in the front so it's like nope carmen's not there then he goes in all the way over probably asked sydney where's chef carmen she said, oh, he's in the walk-in with Richard. Then he goes, oh, okay, I'll go I'll go tell him. And then he goes in, and then he tells Carmen that. And then you look at Carmen. Carmen says, heard, but, like, where's that information stored? And, again, like, I know I'm going into, like, kitchen productivity nerd mode here, but, like, that really sucks if – what if Carmen forgets, number one? Number two, what was the time waste and the time suck that was, I need to take this piece of information, I need to relay it to chef? Such an inefficient way to do it. I love this. Carry carry stuff around in gastros. For that pot for me, please, yes, chef. chef. You want a cartouche? Please, well, thank you, chef. Cartouche. What's our best day here? Five. All right, we were just asked about a cartouche, and so I have a piece of parchment paper to show you exactly what it is. And so basically, what you do is you take that piece of parchment, you fold it in half, so it's like a book. Then you fold it in half again. And now that we have this 90 degree angle, this is our point. And so now we just continue to fold that in half. So I'm going 90 into 45 degrees. Keep that point. Take this, fold it in half again. And now it looks kind of like a paper airplane. And now I'll fold it in half usually one more time. You can keep going, folding, 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 and it will just get more and more and more circular. Now, you'll take whatever container you need, so let's say this is a pot, and you just measure it out from the center of that pot. So you're trying to get a, a, a radius, not the diameter, the radius, right? So you take the, this point and you put it in the center of your pot and you measure out, and then when it hits the edge of that pot, you make a mark. And then once you take that mark, you can snip it wherever that mark is, and then some people really like to make a little bit of a hole in the center of it, so you'll just cut the tip off. And then if you take this and you unfold it, now it's a circular lid 
for your pot, for your rondeau, for whatever. And you see like this wasn't quite uh, wide enough for the pot that I needed. But for the most part, this is actually designed to do a combination of keep some moisture in and let some moisture out. So the idea being without this, if you left this on medium heat and it was just simmering, bubbling, simmering, simmering, bubbling, this might get dry, go to sec in 40 minutes. But with this on, you could go for 90 minutes without it completely evaporating. However, you don't want it to be so wet that you ultimately leave a lid on it and there's a tight seal on it because then it could boil for two and a half hours and it wouldn't lose all the moisture. So that's a cartouche made out of parchment paper and it's designed to help with moisture management when you're doing braises and stews and sauces. Housekeeping means you have to clean your stations because this place is fucking gross. I refer to everybody as chef because it's a sign of respect and I never said I couldn't figure out the spaghetti. I said it doesn't make any sense on this menu, so it is done. All right, let's break down a couple things here because we just saw the cartouche go into the pot and there's three points that Carmen mentioned that I wanna kind of break down a little further here. The first one is like, why did he ask her to stir the pot for him? I think that's a common thing that you'll see head chefs do. And it's almost like a pseudo kind of like, make sure my stuff's doing okay. And it's kind of like, give you a little bit of responsibility, like give give you a part of the process delegated away. And then ultimately it will get to this place where it's full delegation and you are just like fully responsible for the, the task. And so it's not like he couldn't stir the pot. It's like, hey, I'm doing other stuff. Can you just keep eyes on this for me? You might see this with like, hey, can you please like flip my... Uh, uh, chips in the oven or hey can you go rotate my whatever on the grill and it's kind of like a power move it's kind of to be able to say it doesn't matter what you're doing what I'm doing is most important and that's kind of an interesting thing that happened there the second piece you heard him talk about housekeeping as like something to say as like you know just a general keep your station tighter and I think that that's a common thing that you'll see because when you're prepping 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 and it's so busy it's easy to let cleanliness fall by the wayside and so to get to a place where you can just like say housekeeping everybody looks around and it's like hey I can take this off I can put this away I'm not really using that anymore that ultimately makes it so that if you do a couple of those checks throughout the day it makes it so that you don't have to have like 30 minute breakdown during the middle of prep because it's like you just do these quick two to three minute it calls it housekeeping because it's like it's light it's not a full room reset it's just like turning the covers down if we're talking about hotels and then the last point he touches on is this idea of I call everyone chef because it's a sign of respect. And there's certainly something to that, right? This idea, I have this whole video talking about the difference between a cook and a chef, and I think that it's better to actually call yourself a chef sooner so that you do start taking more responsibility for things. The thing that always stuck out to me was when I worked for Thomas Keller, I thought it was so funny that he would call everyone chef because Thomas Keller at the height of things has like hundreds of employees and there's no way he can remember everybody's name and so it was actually really convenient I think for him if I'm kind of extrapolating for him to be able to just walk around any of his restaurants and say how's it going chef and he doesn't have to remember names if I, like there's a secondary benefit sure maybe it's about respect but I think at its core it's really helpful because you don't have to remember everybody's name the classic I mean listen I have a Noma book it's right there like the the meme of having a Noma book what? this shit right here made you pompous and delusional and a fucking gay rod. <laughs> Fuck you, fag. This fucking fairy's butt buddy. These fuck... Okay, so to play devil's advocate on this situation, because there's kind of two possible scenarios. One is that the stove is just so hot and the pilots are on where regardless of what touches that stove, if it's been there for longer than like two minutes, it's probably going to be rip roaring hot. That's one thing that, you know, he's only clearly been here for two weeks. He might not completely understand that yet, but I find it hard to believe that with all his time in kitchens, he wouldn't have known that that was hot and that he should have grabbed it with something. The other thing that could have totally happened, which happens all the time, is you put a pot on. So let's say I'm me. I'm not Carmen. I had intended on starting something in that pot. And so I turned it on like medium high, medium, you know, like I turned it on a, 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 a heat level and I got taken away to do something else or the chopping that I was doing was taking a little bit too long and I was like fuck so I turn around and I turn the the burner down but the so the burner's off right and there's nothing in the pot but it's super super hot and nobody and I haven't told anyone anything about that now the person who goes to grab that and says oh there's nothing in this pot and, and the burner's not on I'm just gonna raw dog grab this thing without a towel of course it's gonna be hot and so the, the the stereotype or the kind of like overarching tip is just assume everything is rip roar and hot and grab everything with a towel whoa 
bread stays the same. All right, let's talk about the towels here for a second because you'll see these kind of orange striped towels in a lot of the shots. These ultimately get taken care of by a third party. And so the restaurant will buy these or kind of rent them is kind of the, the way that it gets technically called is that they'll they'll order a certain number of towels per week. And so then that just kind of gets uh, delivered in a bag. And then it's just a bunch of clean towels at the start of the week or, you know, at a, at a, on a certain day. And then those ultimately become your towel stash for the week. And if it's, uh, you know, 500 towels and you're open five days a week, you get to use 100 towels a day. And so if there's 10 line cooks, that's 10 towels per line cook, which feels crazy, but I just said that for math's sake. And so what's cool is the restaurant is now then not responsible for laundering the towels at the end of the week. So they all just go into a bag. They might be soiled. They might be full of oil. They might be full of puree, whatever. And that whole entire bag like gets sent back to that place. They wash them, they launder them, and then they get delivered. Delivered. So uh, depending on depending on the city and depending on the company, sometimes they'll fold them, sometimes they won't. In my experience, towel folding is a project that, you know, gets included as part of your prep list, which is kind of interesting. But to that point, they're super durable. You're not going to get ones delivered that have holes in them. So if they if you send back towels and they're burned or they have holes in them, they just kind of get docked from your invoice every single month. Like you pay for the towels. And then over time, you're just you don't have these like raggedy messes of towels and you don't have to be responsible for so much laundry. I love that they included Maddie Matheson in the show. Bear? Is this too difficult? Yeah, fact. That's the point. It's already ultra confusing. As the yeah, maintenance homie, guy. It, it, it's a Norwegian knockoff of Mortal Kombat. Carmen, you're bleeding. Oh, shit, man. Stupid dull ass night. You're making me corner. Corner. Oh. Fucking dead, oh. Ibrahim. You Carmen, your fault. Say corner. Blood. You see? Not shoot me. Good. Good. Y'all happy now? Can I have my fucking knife back? I'm not happy. Say not corner. All right, we've seen this happen a couple times. So we talk about these things like hazard labels and location notification words. So these are behind, this is corner, this is hot, this is sharp, all the things that you'll say in conjunction with one another as you're moving around a, a kitchen. Because to that point, you're moving so quickly and you're so head down and you might actually be carrying things that you need to focus on making sure that those don't fall over. And it's a location notification word is what I call it. So if you're coming around a corner, you'll say the word corner in an effort to make it known to whoever might be coming around the other side of that corner that there's somebody coming. And the same thing with behind. The idea is if you're in your space, if you're in your circle of movement, you should be able to move freely around without constantly having to like stop, check, stop, check. Because you might move 10 times and only one of those times was there actually somebody behind you. So you're not going to be have to waste your time and mental capacity saying turning around, turning around, turning around. You'd rather be told when someone is is behind you so that when you go to instinctively make that move, you know that someone is there. And that's why these words are so important and why things go wrong when people don't use them. One last thing, because I think it's really funny, is that sometimes when you're pumping with adrenaline and you're so stressed about service or you screwed something up or you're trying to lock in on a prep project, you can honestly not feel the pain. I think that it's people might think that it's kind of crazy to think that, oh, his finger was bleeding and he wasn't even feeling it. When you're in the moment and you're, all these other things are rushing through your head and your body and you have chemicals r surging through your veins, you can look down and you will have just like blood dripping down your arm, right? I know it sounds crazy that he didn't even notice that he was bleeding, but it's completely happened to me and I'm sure there are people in the comments who will also agree with me. Stop shooting. Hey, listen, go home already. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. Oh my God. I'm like, so I'm like, okay, now there's a problem. I'm trying to enjoy my tacos. You're ruining my date, right? Rip finds his knife on the ground underneath. The... So that, 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 that means multiple things. It means, one, it was dropped, right? So there's probably a chip somewhere in there. And number two, it either clang, clang, clanged, so there's multiple chips underneath it, or it just dropped straight down and then someone un un accidentally kicked it underneath the low boy there. And so there's multiple abuse moments that this knife had to go through. And clearly it's the thing he grabbed first out of his knife bag. And that means that it is like a workhorse. It means something. It's not just like the throwaway kind of just like he uses this knife. My real last name is Woods. Name 
Okay, let's see if I can find one of these like I I have. This is super common where you'll see folks. So like I have my French laundry book here, right? This guy has his Noma book. And if I were to kind of just open this, I would randomly know that there was something in here, which is like, this is a French laundry thing. This is uh, something from Per Se. And so like I externed at Per Se, I uh, worked at French laundry. And so like I have the thing in here, which is, yep. So this is the uh, completion of my externship, the letter that's in here. And then I have another letter in here that's like handwritten by Thomas Keller that's in here. And I think what's so funny about chefs and their like heavy hitter cookbooks, the French Laundry one, the Noma one, the Favikin one, the Relay one, all of these ones from Lestrance, Michel Bra, Ferran Adria, Muguri, it's like all these books, the Alinea book is a popular one, is that like for a lot of us, this is the only thing that comes with us. And it's also like, depending on what we spent on these, 50 bucks is a lot. And so it's kind of like you bought this book, you use it, and it's kind of, it becomes a part of your identity as you like move around. And then weirdly, you'll you don't have filing cabinets or like other things that you keep documents in. And so you'll keep books and papers and menus and stuff inside of your cookbooks because you know that this stuff comes with you. Somebody come try this cousin. Yeah, right. That was perfect. There you go, chef. Chef. Come on. This is a huge morale booster, getting chefs to try the food and get an understanding for especially when you as the leader have made it, what you're basically doing is showing like, here's how it's done. Wink, wink. Great family meal presentation. So using deli containers. And the reason that they use these deli containers like this is because if someone from the front of house or one of the chefs is eating and they happen to kind of like bump the table and a bowl that you would normally use for service, you use it for the soup course and you're eating your family meal out of that falls and breaks. That's like $16, $19, $34 worth of a, you know, expensive handmade piece. And now you're down something that, you know, the guests should be able to be eating out of versus this. If like someone brashes the, you know, like a, a deli container and it falls on the ground, ground and it breaks, who cares? Like that was like eight cents worth of a, a deli container. And the other piece that's interesting is that these are 16 ounce deli containers. And so portion wise, if these are filled all the way up, that's like a pound of food. And so that's actually really nice because now you can, uh, instead of having you know, like wide plates or even like a coupe bowl where you're serving staff food in, you know, these work for sauces, these work for braises, these work for salads. There's there's so many things that these work in. And so you have to kind of think about them like uh, cylindrical bowls versus anything else. It's a one-two punch. So you have your meat, your rice, your veg, your salad. Yo, family's up. Let's go. Yeah. And she asked about stale bread so that she could have something else to put up with staff food. And you see that on the front of the table there. <laughs> this is a great staff food scene. Just, you know, like talking shit, sitting down. These are the dishwashers, the pastry person, the sous chef, the front of house person. They're all sitting together. And for people watching, like, it's not like every single staff food you have to go around the table and say what you're grateful for. But it's just like a fun you piece of conversation. Plate? All good. Thank you, chef. You chef not eating staff food is super normal. Wow, Unfortunately, I just never had black delicious is impressive. That's good. You see that difference? Big time. So this is crazy important because I think that a lot of people talk shit on the molecular gastronomy, modernist cuisine places and not really understanding what it takes to run a, a, a small casual place or a, even a sandwich shop or a butchery place or a chicken wing joint or a burger spot or a tavern or a bar and grill. And you can see it come out in this moment where it's, you know, all of these guys are talking about system this, system that, but they can't actually articulate what the system is. It's just the way that we've always done it is kind of the way that they express it. Where in reality, when stuff hits the fan, you see it when Carmen jumps in with something like this. He knows how to affect the humidity in an oven for baking bread because he's worked at some of these places. And again, you can learn some great stuff at casual places, but I think this idea that 
all of the stuff that's done at the at the higher echelon of places is like just frou frou. And we just heard that line about tweezers and foie gras and Napa and how it doesn't matter. When in reality, it's like there's tons of stuff that Carmen learned from those experiences because he had to do so many different components on the dishes that he was in charge of that now when he runs into a problem with something like bread, he can snap into it and know exactly what to do. Hey, grab me a fresh palm brie. All right, chef. Parm brick basically is this idea that when you get Parmesan in, it comes in big pieces because the wheels, if you've ever seen like the chef's table of Massimo Butura and they have the big giant wheels of Parmesan, when you order it, it's almost always by the pound. And so if, you do, if you're not a big enough place where you're getting the whole wheels in, you'll get these kind of like cut wedges of Parmesan. And what's really hard about that is that if you're using something like a microplane or even just like a box grater to grate your Parmesan, or even if you're using like a robo coop and you're kind of feeding it into this hopper that has a grater inside of it, you need to break down the cheese into smaller pieces. And so what you'll often see restaurants do is they'll take this big wedge, which might be like, it might be a four pound wedge of Parmesan. And when that comes in, it's easier to break it down into smaller blocks that then can be grated on a microplane easier, or box grated or fed into the robo coop a little bit easier. And so he just asked for a block of parm. That's what that means. All right, we're doing episode two as part of this video as well. Chef's table, 38, two people. Okay, this is a pretty funny scene because I knew this kitchen. I was I looked at it and I was like, hey, I know what kitchen that is. And, and that's because that's me. I'm there without a beard. This is that same kitchen. You can tell because the spice rack on the wall, the wooden spice shelf is exactly the same. And that is Grace. So I was the youngest member on the opening team of Grace back in 2012. And yeah, they definitely shot that scene, this scene in that kitchen. And I think what's so cool about it is the fact that they say that this is in New York. All right, just to prove it to you this is just a quick uh you know kind of article on when grace closed and so the idea was that there was almost like a fishbowl design so you could kind of see inside the kitchen from the outside but you couldn't hear anything you couldn't smell anything so the dining room was out here there was a big open wall pastry section was here and then it was kind of like two different sides of the line and so this is andrea correa she has been on the repertoire podcast before fantastic conversation with her and so you can kind of see in this part right here so if you look inside of this this is the paste this was the pastry section and so in this scene when he's here he's standing on what is this pass right here so they must have set up the camera on the other side and then you could kind of just look back into the entire kitchen and for the most part that made it easy for them to have a kind of like pass but in reality what we would do is we would serve all of the food off of the two larger countertop sections here and then front of house would come in from the side and then they would grab food here and then they would run to whichever table it was so yeah, this is the Grace Kitchen. This is not some restaurant in New York where Carmen used to work. But yeah, just so you know. People. Hey. Table 23, four people. Yeah, it's not in New York. It is it's in Chicago, which makes sense. Oh, chef. Thank you, Chef. Wait on 31. Okay, does anybody else see this as Dave Posey? Did anybody else look at this guy and was like, that's definitely Dave Posey? Because I saw this and I was like, oh my God, like... So he, he, he used to be the chef at this restaurant called Blackbird, and then he ultimately went up and uh, uh, moved and opened a place called Elska with his wife. And I've heard it's a great place, but I have yet to go eat there. Phenomenal chef in the Chicago food scene. Hey. It was my fault. Go. Fine. Fire 19 chefs. So that's getting sent home effectively, which I've I've been there. I've I've gotten sent home from this restaurant, from working at this exact place where this scene is being shot. I've uh, gotten sent home. Hey! Hold on, seventeen. Oh, let's say fucking hands. Hands. You should be dead. 
Okay, pretty classic kind of abuse scene. I've certainly been here. I've been uh, told things about my family that I happened to have shared with the chef that I was working for, and that was gotten brought up on me. And, you know, just individual kind of like pressure tests on people. And it's unfortunate that that's this is the this is true. Like I'm not the only person. The, the Carmen is not the only chef in the world to have gotten this type of you know. And 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 it, it sucks because they portray it as coming from this person who is clearly not working a station, not technically kind of like doing the schmoozy hospitality thing with the guest, but he's actually just have walked in from the back in a perfectly starched chef coat. And just comes up and berates Carmen for something that one of his chef de parties did inaccurately or not to the standard that the restaurant had set. And so, you know, like there's there's not much more to say on it other than it like it's it sucks that that was the that's still the behavior that and and what's what sucks too is that like you can see moments in the future of the show where Carmen has these insights of like, oh, well, when I get upset, I have to also react like that. I also have to take out my aggression like that. I also have to set the standard like that. And it just continues down the lineage of, I only do like, I I, I talk like this, I act like this because that's how I was treated. And so therefore, in order to kind of like continue to discipline the next generation, make sure that they have just as high standards as I do, I have to continue to berate. I have to continue to yell. I have to demean. I have to have this and and what sucks is the yes chef kind of ideal kind of falls to pieces in moments like this. It makes you lose faith in the phrase and it also it, it twists it, right? Whereas in the good times, it can be like, yes, yeah, chef, it's like a rallying cry. So you're so excited to be able to kind of like get behind this initiative and work for this person. But then it turns into this like, you know, just kind of like bark at me you know, kind of, kind of conversation. That's, it's just, I felt this scene. I totally felt this scene. And I feel like I'm uniquely qualified to talk about it because I used to work at this place. Yeah. Well, at the French laundry, you know how much time we'd spend. Go fuck your French laundry. Stupid fucking name. All right, then and Noma. Oh, and fuck your Noma too. System, babe. Noma's the shit, huh? (laughs) The best. (laughs) teach you to operate at a level you didn't even know you could operate at, Marcus. And just so we're clear, I wanted to work here. It's so easy to boil this scene down to talking shit on Michelin-starred kitchens. And I don't don't get me wrong. There's there's totally examples of people who go spend time at a place or even go eat a meal somewhere. And they, do, do you know that, do you know those memes where people talk about like, oh, the friend who went backpacking in Europe or the friend who went on a study abroad trip to France and then comes back to their little Midwestern town and is just so much better than everybody else and all of a sudden talks about fashion all the time or talk like has tea in the afternoon all of a sudden now when previously they never would have even craved something like tea of course like i think that there's people who are like that but there's this concept called the inner citadel i don't know if any of you folks have heard of this it's this idea that like you forego the desire for things when you can't have them and so it's this idea that oh well noma's bullshit because i can't get a job at noma or the french laundry is a stupid place to go learn from because i can't go work there and this extends to other things right like michelin stars are stupid because i don't have any right where you you retreat to what's called this inner citadel because you have told yourself that you're removing yourself from the game and therefore it's not bad that I haven't achieved these things it's that I don't want them at all and Sydney says it great it's not about going to learn for things there it's about being inspired sometimes it's about this idea that someone's operating at such a high level I shared this in the, the repertoire newsletter the other week where magic is just someone spending a longer time on something than anyone would reasonably expect And I think at a lot of these high caliber places, that's what it is. It's cleaning to an extent that you wouldn't expect. It's plating to an exactness that you wouldn't expect. It's setting your station up in an organizational structure that you wouldn't typically expect or that, you know, if you just kind of throw up your hands, it's "Ah, it's fine. Like, don't worry about it. Like, it's whatever. I think people, it's easy to fall into that and you can always kind of go back to that. But this idea that you want to continue to maintain those high standards and stay at that level and, you know, continue to operate like that, that's what gets, you know, people like me ex- excited about working at places like that. Cream machine is broken. <laughs> Fuck no. That's the other thing that's so funny about this scene is they get all the way to the end and it's it's both, right? So like 
Richard knows stuff that Carmen doesn't, and Carmen knows stuff that Richard doesn't. And that's okay. It just becomes this kind of flexy thing that people get. It's, it becomes a huge dick measuring contest, and it's so annoying. I asked you folks on Twitter what percent of your day you spend cleaning, and the average answer was like anywhere between 30 and 50 percent. So that's what this kind of scene is, uh, you know, meant to draw attention to, is how much cleaning is actually involved in the day-to-day. -day. It's wild. But it's necessary. It's a necessary part of the job. Notice the combination of foods here. So this is a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. This is a bag of Doritos, and it's a Coke. And the funniest thing about this is a meal, which for chefs who have worked in professional kitchens, this is like, this is the go-to, right? Is a couple things. Didn't require a stove, right? Didn't require an, a, a, a chopping knife, right? So like you didn't, even if it was like, you could say, oh, go home and make yourself a salad. Don't want to bust out a knife, man. Like, and then the third thing, all three of these things are incredibly carb dense, Carb or sugar, you know what I mean? Sugars are carbohydrates, but you know what I mean, where it's like bread, peanut butter, jelly, Doritos, and Coke. All of these together, someone can do the math in the comments for me on how many calories are in this meal. There's salt from the Doritos, there's caffeine from the Coke, and it's like, this is probably one, comfort food for Carmen, number one. Number two, doesn't require a ton of work to get this made for yourself. And number three, it just gives you the satiation, like your body just gets satiated by these foods because... It's just like they're so calorie dense and there's carbs there. So you're going to get a blood sugar spike after eating and drinking this. And then you fall asleep watching Anthony Bourdain. Or PBS. Classic. On the couch. Okay, so I will kind of talk. There's two scenes in this uh, entire show where they do like the CGI fire. And I think that it's kind of shitty CGI. Like, sorry, it, 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 small criticism on this show. I think you could have had a little bit better CGI on this. But the fact that this is frozen food actually in pans, smoking and on fire in this guy's apartment while he's having a nightmare is, you know, like I never took it this far, but my wife will tell me stories of when we were dating when I, you know, up until probably like, I'm going to say like three, four years ago, I was still having service nightmares and uh, replaying scenes from uh, uh, chefs yelling at me. I have had nightmares of having to go try to get my job again at restaurants where I'm not there anymore. I've had nightmares of services. I, t I talk in my sleep. All these things of, you know, replaying moments, uh, getting down on yourself, uh, times when you screwed up, uh, moments of intense responsibility, or again, just replaying negative times from your career in professional kitchens in your dreams. It's, you know, call it PTSD if that's what you want to call it, but it's like, it's, 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 it's common. I've never taken it that far. But it, that was relatable. That was a relatable AF. The nightmares were related to it. I get paid to stage. I want to get paid to work. Okay, so staging. Let's talk about staging really quickly because I didn't touch on it the first time she talked about it. So a stage, think of it like a working interview. And a stage, for all intents and purposes, could be a just one day I'm checking out the restaurant and I'm not trying to go for a job. Sure, there are those types of stages. And what that's cool for is similar to Sydney's point about Noma is just inspiration. You're wanting to spend time in a new environment, see some different food, meet some different people. And listen, the working for free thing gets talked about and tossed around a lot. And I, I totally get it. You know, there's people who work for six months somewhere doing the exact same thing. They're not getting anything reciprocated from that relationship, which I think is really sad. But there's also other moments where, you know, like how cool is it that you can find a high performing place and you can go just work there for a day and see all the behind the scenes of what's going on. You can't do that on other industries. Like certain industries, sure you can, but this idea that you could like go hang out at Facebook for a day and see the back end of how their ad product works, or you can go to Nintendo and see how they are building their video games. You can't do that, but in restaurants you can, and that's really cool. 
number two, I think what's so interesting is like you saw the the resume exchange that happened between Carmen and Sydney at the in, in episode one. And it's this idea that like you can talk a resume, 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 but until Carmen sees her cook, it's totally uh, 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 he ha- kind of just has to take her word for it. And so that's also happening. He's getting a chance to see how she performs. And then also Sydney is start being able to see, do I like working in Carmen's kitchen? I think that's also really interesting and a real benefit to staging. And so apparently the way this was set up is that she staged for a week. And that was, you know, for all intents and purposes, the interview that now leads them to this conversation where she's going to decide, do I want the job? And he's going to decide, do I want to hire her? Here. Get it, girl. A lot of words. Yeah, but they, they, they basically say we're getting killed on labor. We're open from 11. This is huge. The fact that she can talk numbers to the chef who clearly is the one in charge of ordering and paying invoices is so huge. And and, and a lot of people, for a bunch of reasons, take it this idea that, you know, like, oh, well, I joined the kitchens because I'm not good at school. Therefore, I'm going to tell myself over and over again that numbers are not for me. I think that's a really negative place and a really, uh, it's a belief that's not serving you as a professional. And so this idea that she can ask for what she wants because she can show that on the other side of implementing these changes, I'm basically going to pay for myself is massive. And then not only that, but it's showing that she can take her eyes up from above the cutting board and be able to contribute to other things in the business. Uh, the support system or- no! No! Okay, this moment, they get a C on the health inspection because of cross-contamination. There's like a, a, a busted uh, part of the kitchen where the gas line is is exposed and it was covered up in a not so, you know, kosher way. And then the sinks where the hand washing is supposed to happen don't get hot. And so that's what I think is so funny that a lot of chefs get, you know, upset about this idea. And there's a pack of cigarettes that gets left next to the stove. And so, you know, everybody's always stressed out about like, oh, they're going to temp our food and we don't cool things down fast enough and blah, 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 blah. When in reality, there's so many other things that the health department is concerned about. And they're almost always like building or equipment or infrastructure related. It's not even about the food. And I know that us chefs get super stressed out about it because you know the the they're, they're going to make me recite the medium well temperature of pork and that's going to be the thing that makes me fail my health inspection when in reality there's so many other things that they are no, no. and the worst thing you can do when you get a health inspection is like withhold information is you have to say like oh don't go don't don't go over there be sure to stay over here because that's the first place they're going to go is wherever you told them not to go and so carmen kind of shows his experience here by saying in the beginning of the episode where he just says like go do your thing tell us if you need anything and then they're going to go around and check all the equipment and all the things they need to check this is such a funny scene because i think a couple of us have probably been there the idea she's you're not seeing it because she's not wearing an explicit chef coat but the way that i see this scene is you got asked to go to the hardware store in the middle of your work day which is so weird to have to go like in public in your chef uniform and like your coat and you're wearing your black pants and your black shoes and your chef coat and you kind of have a coat on top of it but like you're in a not kitchen place doing things for work i think this is super um, relatable i'm sorry about that I, but I related none to of it. that like that stuff. I wanted to touch quickly on the apron that Carmen's wearing in this scene. I have one of them here. This is just a Brigard blue apron and they they sell these. Uh, these are the French laundry blue aprons. Almost everybody gets one and it usually has a tag that says Brigard on here, but because these are reversible, well, they're not technically reversible, but we would, so you can always tell because of the way that the stitching is on the, the kind of belly section, which way is in and which way is out. But the idea is that you kind of tie it here to adjust if it goes up or down. And then it's just a very durable apron and it's like a canvas style material. And what's nice about these is that they, um, they don't hold on to lint from your towels very much. That's why these are super nice to wear. And, you know, like I said, we cut the tags off so that you can reverse them and wear them either direction. But if anybody was ever wondering, what type of apron is that that he's wearing? They're, they're from Brigard, and the, he jokes that he worked at the French Laundry, and that's where mine is from as well. Some kid painted with his ass. It doesn't have to be a place where the food is shitty or where everybody acts shitty Pretty and sad. feels shitty. Like, it could be a good, legit spot. Okay, you know what, Sydney? I think what she says here is so pointed because... 
a lot of us have probably felt like this where it's like it's that thing that often goes unsaid but everybody's thinking it maybe is the best way to say it where it's like all of us want a better cleaner higher standards working environment and it doesn't have to not be nice and for those of us that have worked at places where it is nice and fun and the camaraderie is there and the standards can be still high and staff food is, you know, t done with care and cleaning is done throughout the day and everybody is on top of their ordering. It's like you see it once and you're like, oh, yeah, it can totally be done. And I think for people who haven't done it or seen it, it can often feel like this thing of like, oh, well, we'll never be that good or the funny thing of like, oh, well, then I, we would actually have to pretend to give a shit. I think it's just funny. Hey, why do you keep calling me? Summer cleaning all the windows. Sing a song about it, be our soul. This is such a reflection of owner chef life where. Bottles of wine, there's a spoon, phone, bills, invoices, HR documents, recipes, no space to actually get proper office admin work done. And oftentimes it just falls on the shoulders of the chef owner. And it's like, oh, well, it's a control thing. Oh, it's a lack of understanding how to delegate thing. There's a bunch of reasons for it. And I just there, there, there are a few other industries where the technical expert and the business side both get roped into the same person, at least with this amount of complexity, right? The idea that there would be someone who is like head of operations and head of creative and the face of the company and head of HR, like all of it being roped under one person. There's like a huge amount of like entrepreneurship that happens when you become an owner. And I just don't think it always gets talked about when people talk about chefs. Everybody thinks of like, oh, the chef is the one that's behind the stove. And in reality, the chef owner does so much more than that on the day to day. And I, hear blue strings of no I was throwing up every day before work. The anxiety is so real. It doesn't, you know, for me, it didn't show up in uh, throwing up. It was more just kind of like lack of sleep and just like over pumping of heart rate and, you know, just like sweaty palms. It's a classic M&M, like knees weak, arms are heavy kind of feeling. But I totally empathize with this. Okay. Well, that sounds chill. Why'd you stay there? I don't know. Um... People love the food. It felt good. It feels like you're contributing to something. It feels like you're part of something that's bigger than you. It feels like you're actually making something of yourself, even though like on paper, like if you were to write down what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, it feels so mundane. But then the second that you tell someone that you're working for this cool place or that you just got XYZ award or that you bring up the name of the chef that you're working for and everybody knows who it is, there's something to that and it can be very addicting and uh, purpose driving. Like it can give you a sense of purpose and meaning almost. So he's right. Chefs always say a big part of the job is taking care of people, right? Yeah, yeah, no, I guess. Okay, well, you can't really do that if you're not taking care of yourself then. Facts. I like when you tell me things. Just Big facts. I'm asking you to look at the thing. Mm-hmm. It's okay to ask for help. Big facts. All right, so this taped down pass with the word sense of urgency also comes from a Thomas Keller line of thinking. He has them tiled into the clocks that are like up above. There's a clock up here. It doesn't say sense of urgency on it, but it's this idea of if you look at the time and there's this word, these words that say sense of urgency on them, every time that you look up at the clock to check what time it is, you will also then see the word sense of urgency. Obviously, the goal of these words to be that you kind of like move with purpose, you're kind of being focused at work. Work and you're not just being lackadaisical about how you approach tasks. Where I found a little bit of kind of, you know, paradox to it is that as you started to see it 
over time, over time, over time, especially if, you know, like I, I wasn't there for a day or a week. Like I worked at this place for years and it got into the place where it almost became like something you would roll your eyes at, where it was like, of course I'm moving with a sense of urgency. Like you don't think that I want to get set up on time. And, you know, it, it kind of like lost its meaning after a certain amount of time. Of course, when you start there, it's like you're so energized, you're so jazzed, you're so engaged, you're so stoked to kind of just get started and be better and hold yourself to a higher standard. But I always found like I don't put sense of urgency on things, you know, because I was in that environment for so long where I basically am at a place now where I can just like I can turn it on and I don't need this reminder when I'm in a kitchen. Thank you. All right, so that was episode one and two of The Bear that I just went ahead and reacted to. If you want to see me do future episodes of this show or if you have questions from episode one or episode two or just thoughts that you had as you were watching these episodes, you can certainly leave them down in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe and like this video if you want to see future breakdowns of shows like this where I just kind of explain a little bit about the around the why and the how of why they chose to make certain decisions and portray things on screen in the way that that they did. Thanks so much as always for your attention. My name is Justin Kana. I hope you have a good one.